Good afternoon. On behalf of the Center for Community Progress, I'd like to welcome you to the August edition of our Cornerstone webinars. My name is Justin Goddard, and I serve as a program officer for National Leadership and Education here at Community Progress. Cornerstone is our monthly webinar series that equips participants with the building blocks to understand and solve tough challenges related to property vacancy, abandonment, and deterioration. For today's Cornerstone, we are joined by both Beth Source and India Walton. Beth Source serves as the Director of Capacity Building for Granite Solutions Network, where she oversees the organization's training and technical assistance programs. Before joining Granite Solutions, Beth developed and preserved shared equity homeownership units in New York City and New Orleans, and joins us today from Boulder, Colorado. India Walton is a registered nurse and the founding executive director of the FB Community Land Trust in Buffalo, New York. FBCLT was created by the community in response to the many challenges of existing next to a flourishing and expanding medical and education campus. Before turning it over to our presenters, I want to mention that we will allow time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your browser and send it both to the webinar host and all panelists. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat box to message the Community Progress host or send an email to Justin Goddard at jgoddard at communityprogress.net. And with that, I turn it over to Beth in India. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, let me. Again, my name is Beth Source, and I'm the Director of Capacity Building for Grounded Solutions Network. And we are a national membership based nonprofit organization committed to cultivating communities that are equitable, inclusive, and rich in opportunity by advancing affordable housing solutions that last for generations. And we have a particular expertise in community land trusts, shared equity homeownership models, and inclusionary housing. And we have been thrilled to partner with the Center for Community Progress over the past few years, really strategizing around more ways to build a pipeline of public properties for lasting affordability. Our agenda today is to provide a brief overview of shared equity homeownership, what it is and the impact it has on the ground, and then to address three myths about the role of shared equity homeownership in weak market neighborhoods and cities. And I'm joined today by India Walton, who, uh, as Justin said, is the Executive Director of the FB Community Land Trust in Buffalo, New York, who's going to talk about her organization and the work that they're doing in Buffalo. And then we will save as much time as possible for questions and discussion. So let's jump right in. Shared equity homeownership is a model of housing development and preservation that balances individual wealth creation with ongoing affordability by centering and supporting low-income first-time homeowners, not only at the point of sale, but throughout their entire tenure in the home. Shared equity programs can be housed in nonprofit organizations or municipal governments, and they all start by selling homes at the low market rate prices that are affordable to low income households, and they typically use one time public investments to make that possible. So, for example, if it costs a program $140,000 to develop a home, but a low income homeowner can only afford a $100,000 purchase price, that program will need to identify $40,000 in public or occasionally philanthropic funds to fill that gap. Typically, that public investment comes in the form of federal funds like home or community development block grants, local funds from housing trust funds, free or discounted land, or fees or units produced through an inclusionary housing program. When the low-income home buyer purchases their below market rate home, they agree up front to sell the home at a below market rate price to an income eligible household. That price is defined by a resale formula, chosen and customized by each local program that is designed to do that balance of wealth creation and ongoing affordability. And when that second homeowner purchases the home, they too agree to the same equity sharing formula. And this happens again and again and again. In this way, shared equity programs are able to take one-time public investments and put them to work serving multiple generations of homeowners. 
A critical element of shared equity programs is providing wraparound services to their homeowners. We know that in order to build wealth through real estate, a family can't just attain homeownership, they need to retain it over time. So shared equity programs establish a long-term legal relationship with their homeowners that not only allows the program to monitor the affordability restrictions placed on the home, it allows them to support the homeowners as well. The legal documents, I tend to think of them as being really focused on supporting homeowners at what I call the danger points. These moments in time when we know first time home buyers can be at risk of losing their home. So the program monitors and even has the ability to intervene if a homeowner is struggling to pay their mortgage or their insurance or their taxes. And the homeowner must request approval when taking large actions like refinancing, um, just so that the program can review the terms of the loan to make sure that they're not predatory. And either directly or through partnership, many programs provide ongoing homeowner education and foreclosure prevention services to make sure that homeowners have access to the support um, needed if and when they need it. So at the most basic level, every shared equity home has an affordability compliance period that includes resale restrictions of at least 30 years. That affordability period is secured in the legal agreement between the program and the homeowner, and the affordability clock restarts upon each resale, basically making that term go on in perpetuity. The legal documents also include a right of first refusal, granting the program the opportunity to buy back the home. And it does, the legal agreement does not allow the homeowner to, quote, buy out the subsidy in their home and lift the resale restrictions at any time. There are three main types of shared equity homeownership models that I will share in just a moment, but they all have these same common elements. They all have a legal agreement, typically a ground lease or a deed restriction that includes the critical elements we just talked through. And they all have a steward, that nonprofit or public program that is on the other side of the legal agreement, sharing the rights and responsibilities to the home, monitoring for compliance and backstopping that homeowner. The first shared equity model is a community land trust. In this model, the nonprofit organization will be called the CLT, uh, Community Land Trust, CLT, and retains ownership of the land and an income eligible homeowner purchases just the improvement, the house. A 99 year ground lease that includes the resale formula ties the land and the home together and establishes the rights and responsibilities of both the homeowner and the community land trust. The CLT is governed by a tripartite board that is made up of three equal parts of representation, one-third leaseholding homeowners, one-third community members from the CLT service area, and one-third stakeholders who are vested in the organization's mission and success. The board of directors is elected by the dues-paying community membership, which is why between the community membership and two-thirds of the board seats being held by community members, we say that CLT organizations are community-led and controlled. The second model is limited equity cooperative. In this model, the cooperative corporation owns the building or buildings, as well as the land underneath. Each tenant shareholder owns a share in the cooperative corporation that entitles them to receive what we call a long-term proprietary lease to their unit, so an owner's lease. To their unit. The cooperative is governed by a board of directors consisting of and elected by the tenant shareholders in that cooperative corporation. And of course, there are many variations on this model. Co-ops can even be layered on top of community land trust land. The third model of shared equity homeownership is deed restricted housing. In this model, the homeowner owns title typically to both the land and the home and the deed to the property includes the same sort of restrictive covenants that you would expect to see in a ground lease or a cooperative share agreement. Shared equity deed restrictions typically last between 30 and 99 years, depending on state law. But again, even if the compliance period is 30 years, if the clock restarts upon resale, most of the homes remain affordable for a much longer period of time. And we tend to see deed restricted programs embedded within larger organizations like Habitat for Humanity Affiliates or within municipal governments. Grounded Solutions recently evaluated the size and scope of the shared equity field, and we found that there are more than 800 nonprofit and public programs across the country that have produced and, or, and are stewarding more than 250,000 units. There was exponential growth in the creation of shared equity programs in the 1990s, and again right now, which makes sense because these tools are typically thought of as hot market tools. 
And we know of programs in 43 states plus Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and numerous countries around the world. My colleague, Vin Swang, recently partnered with the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy to produce the largest study of shared equity homeownership program growth and performance ever. Uh, it covers CLTs, limited equity cooperatives, and deed-restricted programs over the past 30 years, which cover four different market cycles. Um, and it looked at different, a number of different performance elements. Um, so I want to share just a few of those findings before we move on to the myth. The study found that shared equity programs typically serve families and households that are excluded from the for sale market. It found that 95% of shared equity homes were affordable to households earning 80% of the area median income or below. It also found that seven out of 10 shared equity homeowners fit the HUD definition of a first time home buyer. And that the, minor, the share of minority households living in shared equity homes rose from 13% to 43%, especially in the past few years. All of these are indicators that support the theory that shared equity programs create an on-ramp to homeownership among households that are typically otherwise excluded from the for sale market. But as I mentioned before, attaining homeownership is not enough. To be able to realize the benefits associated with homeownership, stability, control, wealth creation, and better health, families have to retain homeownership over time. Our study found that 99% of shared equity homes avoided foreclosure proceedings, and remember that the foreclosure crisis was part of that market cycle that fell within um, the study period. It also found that families on average typically invested about $2,000 to purchase their home and accumulated about $14,000 in earned equity. And furthermore, we found that six out of 10 shared equity homeowners use their equity to purchase a market rate home. So it really does seem as though shared equity programs are an effective on-ramp to homeownership for low-income families that allows households to build wealth, move on to an unrestricted home, but still make that same opportunity available to the next generation of home buyers. With that foundation of shared equity homeownership behind us, and please, again, as Justin said, if you have questions about um, kind of the basics of shared equity homeownership, please do put them in, um, and Indy and I will try to address as many of them as possible. Um, but with that foundation of shared equity homeownership behind us, I want to move on to talk about three myths that I often hear working on the national level in different weak market neighborhoods and cities. The first is that by nature of the market, homes are affordable, so we don't need an affordable housing intervention. Um, let's break down this myth for a second. I say that homes are often described as affordable, but they're actually low cost, low quality homes. On the for sale market, while a purchase price may be low, the resources needed to renovate the home to get it to a livable state may be quite high. And it can be really difficult for anyone, and it's especially a low-income first-time home buyer, to finance that renovation of a new home while still paying rent at their current residence. And that's even more difficult when the cost of renovation exceeds the appraised value of the home. So in this way, I think often that these low purchase prices are kind of, act, they act like a smoke screen. It really means that there's a deficit of high quality, move-in ready homes for sale that are accessible to low-income families. And so shared equity models can be a good option for providing those renovated homes for sale for a couple of key reasons. Um, first, renovating and selling that home at an affordable price, especially if it's above the appraised value, which oftentimes it is, can be very costly. And so by ensuring that the home is affordable long term, we can make sure that the large investment, investment sorry, needed will help um, exponentially more households have access to home ownership than otherwise would have been available, right? Because that same home, that same investment is going to serve the first buyer and the second buyer and the third buyer and so on. And again, those wraparound services that shared equity programs provide homeowners really helps to ensure that they will be successful, leading to better outcomes for their families and an asset, that home, right, that is likely to serve uh, future households. Because if a household goes through foreclosure, not only is that household worse off, but that home is lost from the affordability program as well. The second myth that I often hear is that the public policy focus should be on building wealth, um, on building a household wealth specifically, rather than on preserving affordability long time. And I think this is incredibly understandable. And 
I don't think that it has to be an either or conversation. Shared equity programs have a track record of, yes, limiting the equity returns that homeowners are entitled to, but also creating a supportive on-ramp to homeownership that has high levels of success um, and creates a pathway to the open market that wouldn't otherwise be available. The backstopping measures and stewardship the, program, um, the programs provide focus on the danger points where we know that first-time homeowners are at the risk of foreclosure and ending up in a worse place than before. And there are a couple of new, innovative examples of shared equity programs supporting existing homeowners, especially seniors, to stay in their homes when trouble hits that I want to share. For example, when new investments are made in a neighborhood, property taxes increase, right? That's part and parcel. For seniors on a fixed income, taxes can get really expensive really fast. And in some cases, folks are in danger of losing their home and all of the equity that they've built to tax foreclosure. In some cities, shared equity programs are offering seniors an alternative. They can stay in their home and bring their home into the shared equity program. In return for agreeing to the new resale restrictions, they're able to tap into tax relief, um, funding to, and support for things like deferred maintenance or missed mortgage payments or making improvements to their home um, so that they can age in place of course, this is not the best or right choice for everyone, but I wanted to share it as an example of this dichotomy in thinking that wealth creation and affordability are polar opposites. What I think more often is that you can't have wealth creation, especially for low-income households, without considering affordability. And the third and final myth that I often hear is that addressing affordability issues can wait because there's so many other urgent community needs that need to be addressed now, like public safety or access to healthy food or healthcare or transportation or jobs. And just as before, I argue that we can't address those other needs and invest in neighborhoods without addressing affordability. We know, and I know India is going to talk more about this and her experience in Buffalo, but the public and private investments made to jumpstart and revitalize neighborhood markets can and will cause displacement of longtime residents. And there's this window of opportunity to invest in shared equity homeownership strategies while land costs are still relatively low so that neighborhoods can develop without displacement, longtime residents can become and remain homeowners, and public policymakers can make the best use of their limited funds. And so with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to India to talk more about her work in the Fruit Belt neighborhood in Buffalo. And again, if you have questions about anything that I've said so far, please feel free to type them, um, and Indy and I will address as many as we can. Thank you, Beth. Um, and I want to thank the Center for Community Progress and Grounded Solutions Network for inviting us to this webinar. Again, my name is India Walton. I am the Executive Director of the FB Community Land Trust here in Buffalo, New York. Um, by profession, I am a registered nurse, and at FB Community Land Trust, we really believe that um, affordable housing is uh, the basis of a healthy community. Um, so, I became involved in work in the Fruit Belt around 2015. There was already work ongoing, and through a bunch of community partners, local nonprofits, labor unions and businesses, um, an organization, a, a loosely based coalition by the name of Community First Alliance was formed to deal with some of the challenges that the community that we call the Fruit Belt was facing in Buffalo as a result of a very successful um, but ever-expanding medical campus that brings in about 12,000 workers on any day. Um, and is the recipient of a lot of public and private investment. But what the community was experiencing was that that investment didn't necessarily translate into an improved quality of life for the folks who live in that um, neighborhood. So one of the first challenges, um, oddly enough, was parking. So one of the first things that we took on was trying to get our city to implement a parking permit system in the Fruit Belt. And this is related um, because we found out that it actually took state level legislation in order to get the parking permit system. And it was able, it was, it allowed us to build a strong coalition and identify the strengths 
that already lied in the community. Um, so at that point, we began to consider negotiations of a community benefits agreement with the medical campus, and um, we felt that the control of lands would be a good way um, to begin negotiations to get some benefits out of um, the medical campus. So as a part of that community benefits agreement, uh, the community identified uh, some acts, um, and those were affordable housing, jobs and training opportunities, parking and traffic relief, community investment, historical and cultural preservation, and really, like I said, harnessing the power of the community to have adequate representation. Um, so eventually we won parking. It's the first time that it's ever happened um, in the state of New York. We were super proud and that also really stoked the fire in order for us to move forward. So we really ran a grassroots campaign to incorporate a community land trust. That was, solution, that was a solution that we chose for ourselves because it included 100% community control, it included development without displacement, and it really fostered a spirit of unity um, for the, the folks who have stuck it out for so long in that neighborhood. Um, so to date, we've established a broad network of support both nationally and locally. Um, we're members of Grounded Solutions Network, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that we would not have gotten to this point without the technical assistance um, and in-kind support from Grounded Solutions Network. Um, we've incorporated and we're officially a 501c3 organization. We've secured startup funding um, to bring on a full-time staff person, which is me. <laughs> Uh, we've cultivated relationships with multi-sector stakeholders. Um, we're in conversations with the BNMC, um, where once they were the target of many of our actions, now we're at the table and beginning negotiations to figure out how we turn these institutions into anchors that actually translate into true community benefactors. Um, we are in conversations with our local municipality to support our movement. We have acquired our first parcels of land, um, and next year we're gonna break ground on the construction of two single-family homes in partnership with our local Habitat for Humanity affili affiliate. And there's just been major shifts in narratives about housing affordability in Buffalo. Like Beth mentioned, there, um, there are some myths about the need for affordable housing in markets like Buffalo um, that has pretty high vacancy rates and simultaneously um, a large population of people who are houseless. Um, so one of the things that I personally am most proud of is this um, cartoon because when we started off, um, the dominant narrative said that there was no such thing as gentrification in Buffalo, that we were too small to be feeling the effects of something like that and that there was plenty of affordable housing. So this is a cartoon um, that was pu published in our local newspaper by Adam Ziegler, who is a Pulitzer Prize award winning um, political cartoonist that really, I think, dis displays what the community was experiencing and feeling um, and put it into a, a great graphic representation. Um, so, uh, to date, we are pursuing um, CHOTO status. We're working through our funding and sustainability plan. Uh, we're assembling our development team and working out our land acquisition strategy. We're also really interested in developing criteria for evaluation and impact. Um, there's always a question of community land trust and scale. Um, so we're really intentional about chronicling and documenting how many lives we touch, um, whether that be through home ownership or through education or through financial literacy. Um, and we're at a point right now where we are professionalizing our infrastructure and our organization um, through systems and infrastructure. So that's all I got. I hope y'all have lots of questions. Um, so I'll pass the ball back to Justin, who will get us started with the Q&A. Yes, 
Hi, everyone. This is Beth. I think we have questions coming in fast and furiously, so I think we're just going to take one quick minute to uh, to read them and then uh, start answering them. So stand by for just one second while we get ourselves together. Okay, I think we should jump right in knowing that more questions are likely to come. Um, so the first question, we got a couple of questions, or sorry, let me start with the first one, <laughs> is are there any examples of community land trust or other shared equity homeownership programs uh, using and revitalizing vacant properties for housing opportunities? Um, and I'll start by saying yes. I think they, one of the things that Grounded Solutions has been partnering with uh, the Center for Community Progress on is really thinking about this, this partnership, especially between land banks and community land trusts. So thinking about how cities uh, and counties who have this portfolio of vacant and abandoned properties, how those could be transformed into long-term affordable homes, uh, either for rent or for home ownership. And so there are some examples of that that are already happening in cities like Albany, New York, where that they have a pretty robust uh, partnership. Um, and then there are new partnerships that are coming up across the country. Um, Houston just Houston in Texas just launched a land bank land trust um, partnership where I think right now they are focusing more on the use of vacant land than renovating vacant and abandoned structures, but um, they're not opposed to it. Albany tends to focus more on the structures than on the land. Um, but as the land bank community is growing and as the CLT community is growing, we're seeing more and more of these partnerships um, come together where there is an operational land bank and an operational CLT happening in the same place. Um, India, is, do you want to touch upon that question from your perspective in Buffalo? Sure. Um, so the, the first project that we're doing is a new build, but we also intend on um, rehabbing some some existing vacant structures. The housing stock in Buffalo is pretty old and there's lots of homes that need renovation. And you know, this the CLT model allows for the retention of subsidy. So that really is the best use of, of public and um, private dollars. Uh, so India, there's another question, or we've gotten this question kind of a couple of times in a couple of different ways around mixed use thinking. Um, so thinking about shared equity models either incorporating or being partnered with rental strategies, commercial strategies, um, student housing or workforce housing. It's, I know that there are examples of that that happen across the country. And in fact, within community land trust specifically, there are actually more rental units um, under community stewardship than there are home ownership units. So it is definitely something that programs can do. Uh, but I'm wondering if, if in your plans for fruit belt, if you've thought about this multi-use type of strategy. We definitely have, and when the question of sustainability comes up, like obviously we're not going to depend on philanthropic dollars for 
in perpetuity. Um, so there is the requirement of a certain number of rental units um, in commercial spaces that would contribute to this long-term sustainability. Like there needs to be a steward of these homes for eternity, right, to keep them permanently affordable. Um, so we are thinking about prioritizing mixed use um, with, that would have affordable rental units on the top and on the ground floor would be long-term lessees um, in, in our preference um, because we are not only an affordable housing provider but also a community wealth builder. We want those to be cooperatively owned businesses. So I think, India, you started to touch on a question, uh, another question that came in was this question of sustainability, right? Um, so the question was raised specifically around, is there a number of houses needed to sustain operations? Really thinking about not just the money that's needed to create, uh, create housing opportunities or even commercial opportunities, but to support that organization long-term. Um, in your business planning, how did you approach that question? Well, <laughs> um, through, the generous, through the generous support of Grounded Solutions Network, we were able to work with an awesome consultant by the name of Mike Brown, who really held our hand and walked us through the process of, you know, thinking about the size of our city and the size of our market. And we came to a number of around 100 units, and that also accounts for um, some rental units in that plan. So we're looking at a sweet spot of around 100 units for sustainability, and that's accounting for a bare bone staff um, that would not have an executive director, but only have a stewardship coordinator who would be responsible for compliance, um, maintenance, and uh, really just looking after um, the, the homeowners, the units, and um, the land trust land. And this was a big topic of conversation amongst the shared equity community a while back, we all thought, or I should say, we all hoped on the national level um, that we could come up with this number, right? That if a program had X number of home ownership units or X number of home ownership units and Y numbers of rental units, that they would be sustainable. And what we found is that, you know, you all probably know this instantly, like there is no magic number there um, because so much of that depends on local context. And so, so, so community land trust and shared equity programs have a number of different revenue sources that they can look to to support their operations. So um, there are membership dues, which honestly are not very high. The goal of many of these organizations is to get members, not to charge members um, a significant fee, right? But there are membership dues. There are ongoing fees that are, are um, charged to the homeowner and built into that affordability calculation so that they're not added on top to make the home unaffordable. But we look at things like ongoing ground lease fees or stewardship fees to help cover the staff costs of monitoring and supporting homeowners. And there are also sometimes one-time fees for really intense um, moments in time. So many programs will charge a resale fee or things like that because it takes a lot of time to market the home and to oversee that process. Again, all of that gets built into the affordability calculator when pricing the home. So it's not a burden to the homeowner. It is, it is factored into the price. Um, so there is, are the membership to there are those fees. Um, sometimes once a program is up and running and they have all of this staff expertise, they're able to offer that to other organizations in a fee-for-service way. So sometimes um, a shared equity program will do the income certification on behalf of another nonprofit organization who doesn't have that capacity and will charge for those sorts of things. So we, we look for other ways to earn income. But there are very few programs out there that are not to some extent or another um, reliant on philanthropic support, um, if not kind of ongoing at certain points in time. And that is true of the nonprofit sector, right? So it's not, it's not something that is unique to shared equity homeownership and, and shared equity programs, but it is a reality. Um, the last thing that I will kind of say about this, that while there is no magic number that we found, um, because staff costs different in 
different places, the level of services are offered and chart, you know, are different in different programs. What we have found is that there are quite a few programs out there that have about 20 homes in their portfolio, and they report that it is very hard for them to sustain those sorts of operations. Um, that it, it really, your kind of ratio of staff to units ends up being really high, and it's just difficult to find the financial support to keep those operations going. And what those programs would also say is that they would, most of them would like to have more than 20 homes in their portfolio. Um, it's not that they built 20 and said, like, this is the change that we wanted to see in our neighborhood, that they're really trying to grow. Um, so I think we, we hear that um, challenge less when programs have, as India was saying, units more in the 100 plus kind of range. We also hear it, um, we hear that organizations, when they look at themselves and define sustainability for themselves, um, tend to feel more and be more sustainable by their definition when they do have a mix of rental and home ownership units um, in their portfolios. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the question. Oh, while we're talking about operations, India, one of the questions was um, a, a question kind of about the support that you all received in your to help you start up um, in terms of where were some of the sources for that funding, if you, if you can share, and kind of what sorts of activities it helped to cover. Sure. I love telling this part of the story because it's pretty remarkable. Um, we just, we have a really rich nonprofit community in Buffalo. So for the first two years, I would say like 98% of our capacity was in kind. Um, so through Grounded Solutions national, on a national level, through Open Buffalo locally, there's um, a local organization called People United for Sustainable Housing or Push Buffalo um, that, lent, that lent us organizing capacity. Our Volunteer Lawyers Association helped us work through our incorporation in C3 status. We have Partnership for the Public Good, do research to put data to the lived experience of, of our people. Um, we have a great partner in government, Darius Pridgen, who's our local council person and also the council president who put a moratorium on the sale of any city-owned property within the Fruit Belt to allow us enough time to develop a strategic plan. And he also gave us um, our first $25,000 in funding to, to get some consulting services, PUSH gave us $25,000 for um, land acquisition, and, you know, those, yeah, like all, all of that help, um, and also just being knee-deep in, in the CLT movement um, got us up to speed to where we've been able to apply for um, a number of grants through the Catholic Campaign for Human Development um, and Enterprise Community Foundation, uh, to, to really get us rolling. We also um, are trying to leverage the community reinvestment dollars from local banks and really um, not only stress the importance of affordable housing on community land trust as a public good, um, but also as a measure of health equity. Thanks. And I think India, some of the organizations, just from a national perspective, I think some of the some of the organizations and the sources of funding that you listed are the ones that we also um, tend to see on the national level. The Catholic Campaign for Human Development has been an unbelievable partner, um, not only to Grounded Solutions but to numerous community land trusts um, as they've been getting started on the ground or growing, um, and they are a they are a faith-based funder, um, and my understanding of how they do local grants is that they open up the application once a year, and that tends to be in the early fall. So if anybody is thinking about this, you should check out the Catholic Campaign for Human Development um, because chances are the, fin the, the window for funding will be opening up in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then I agree, I think a lot of folks, especially as they're getting started, are, um, are tapping into funding from their local community foundations, um, from local banks. And we have also seen quite, and th this is becoming, I don't want to say a trend, but this is becoming um, more frequent. We're seeing 
some of the early stages around feasibility analysis and things like that, um, either being taken by a city or being funded by a city through some of their flexible funding sources. Um, so we are seeing uh, municipal governments enter into this kind of support stage for getting an independent nonprofit community land trust um, or shared equity program get started in a way that um, I don't think we've really seen a whole lot of in the past. There's another, there were a couple of questions that were around um, scatter site versus contigu contiguous development. Um, and the question of, is it possible to do scattered site? Is it all kind of contiguous? And what are some of the pros and cons of each, especially around um, concentrating poverty and, and or the flip of kind of creating access to neighborhoods that maybe low-income folks can't afford to access right now? Shared equity, shared equity programs definitely do both, and sometimes even within the same program, they will have a development strategy for, for new opportunities that is both scattered site and contiguous. Sometimes that is um, new construction in either strategy. Sometimes it is acquisition and rehab in either strategy. And sometimes when it is a scattered site program, we do what we're calling buyer-initiated programs, which is basically um, a homeowner could come to the program and say, uh, I would like to purchase a home. And the program does some basic, uh, you know, assessment of them to make sure that they would be eligible. And they would say, okay, based on your income and, and things like that, it looks like you're able to afford a purchase price of $100,000. Well, that's great because we have $40,000 that we can help um, to give you to purchase a, a $140,000 home. So go out, find the $140,000 home in the neighborhood um, that you would like, and, and we will buy it together. And basically what happens is that the, that shared equity program, um, like any other way, sinks that money into the home in a way that it's not going to come back out. The homeowner gets to purchase that home at the below market rate price that is affordable to them, and then through the resale restrictions to pass that on. Um, so I think that shared equity programs have really been tackling that question um, and answering it differently for each one of themselves. Sometimes it really is about scattered site, wanting to get into um, neighborhoods that don't have a lot of affordable housing right now. And sometimes it is very intentionally trying to work in a limited geographic area to prevent displacement um, and to strengthen community that already exists. India, do you yes. want to share your perspective? Yes, great. Sure. This this is also a question that we've been um, grappling with, right? The reason why we exist is because this is what our neighborhood chose as a solution to a pressing issue, and there are other neighborhoods in Buffalo that feel the same pressure, right? So there there's a question of scalability and capacity, and what we are looking into recently is a federation because we don't we don't want to take the community control out of the equation. Buffalo has distinct neighborhoods with their own identities, and we believe that people should be able to choose for themselves the type of development that happens in their own neighborhoods. So we're looking um, more toward a federation model so that way we can share resources, we can share technical assistance, but there's still a deep sense of community in the process. So. Yes, absolutely, we do not want to reconcentrate this advantage. We don't want all affordable housing in one neighborhood. We definitely want a mixed income, high quality amenity um, neighborhood in the Fruit Belt and all throughout um, the Buffalo area. So that is something that we've been paying a lot of attention to. India, there's another question that I think is really great for you. Um, which is what partners do you think are critical to have at the table when you're getting started? And then even when you're moving into, we're kind of past the startup phase, but now we're in long-term operations. <laughs> yeah, all of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can never have enough minds at the table. Um, so we work with people in healthcare, people in social work, um, lawyers, social justice advocates, economists, specifically new economy folks who really have an eye toward, um, you know, shared equity models, co-op models, um, alternate methods of currency and things like that. So, 
yeah, all of the partners. We want to work with everyone. And um, I call myself the modern age Robin Hood. So, like, we don't turn any money away. I mean, like, we don't want blood money, but, you know, we'll work with banks who have a history of redlining and not lending to people in our community. Like, here's your chance to make it up. Yes, we want your money, too, um, and your expertise, and um, for profit developers who want to come and build your big ugly building in our neighborhood, we want to work with you also so that we can make the building less ugly and also so that you can reinvest in the community that you are putting this pressure on. Um, so, yep, everyone. Yeah, and I think some of the people who I see, because I tend to do more of the technical stuff um, when working with organizations, is like appraisers and realtors mm -hmm. and some of those like real estate industry people can be your biggest advocates. Um, and they can be uh, significant barriers oftentimes because, especially when a program is getting started, we're asking people to step outside of what is what they're really comfortable with in their day-to-day -day job, and we're asking them to do it for just a couple of units. And I recognize that that is a really big ask and the right thing to do. And most people, when they get it, they're really like embracing of the model and happy to help. Um, so there's one question around property taxes that I want to answer quickly because I think it leads into the final question that I, that, has, that I think is really good one of kind of talking some more about the affordable housing dynamics um, in weaker market cities. So in shared equity programs, um, it is not automatic that there is some kind of reduced taxation for shared equity homeowners, but that is always our goal. Um, because what we say is that if you can never tap into the fair market value of your home, you shouldn't be taxed at the fair market value of your home. And taxes can very easily erode the affordability of a home. And it's important for people to pay taxes because we drive on roads and we attend schools and we access services and things like that. Um, so oftentimes, um, shared equity homeowners pay less, do pay taxes, and they're responsible for the taxes on their home, but um, we work to make them be less than market rate. They tend to be assessed at the resale restricted value or some approximation of that. Um, and folks, if, you know, if it's a home ownership unit, are also eligible for homestead exemptions and, and um, poverty exemptions and things like that, that that may exist in their jurisdiction that are not tied to shared equity home ownership. So, a, a question came in, and I think, India, I would love to hear your perspective about this, too, of talking a little bit more about the dynamic of affordable housing um, in, in weaker market cities. Is, that it, is it just that there is a dearth of, of high-quality homes? Is it that taxes are unaffordable? Is it that evictions are really high? Like, what are all of the dynamics that are going into this? And I think my cheater answer is, yes, it is all of that. Um, I think we have found in some of the cities that I've been working in that um, tax foreclosure is a huge driver of displacement um, for existing house, for existing homeowners and for existing renters who are paying those taxes as they're getting passed through from their landlords. Um, not having significant uh, tenant protection so that when a renter is uh, trying to demand the necessary improvements to make their home livable, that that can result in eviction. So it, in, in my experience, the dynamic is definitely not one thing. It's all of these things together. Um, but India, I, w I wonder if you have something more insightful to say based on your experience in your neighborhood. I would say that it is a similar thing. Um, also, just the, the speculation makes it difficult, right, when, when rent mm -hmm go up because people think the neighborhood's going to be hot, um, it, it just makes, it drives up the prices, right? And there is, like I said, the housing stock in Buffalo, a lot of it is pretty old, so there's a lack of quality affordable housing. So now you get people into situations where the housing is unsafe. So maybe they can afford to pay the rent, but code enforcement comes out and said that there's lead paint or repairs that needs to be done, and now the person is involuntarily evicted because the landlord won't get the property up to cold, um, things like that. So, I mean, it's pretty much the same story everywhere you go. Yeah. I do think, I, 
I do think from a home ownership perspective, like I think that, especially when you're trying to advance home ownership, everything that is impacting folks on the rental market impacts their ability to become homeowners, right? If you don't have a stable place to rent, there's no way that you can save for a down payment or even have the mind space to think about home ownership. That's one of the things we hear a lot with shared equity homeowners that when they, when they close on their home, they're like, we never even thought that this would be a possibility for us. But I do think that, again, I, I think that just from a pure myth perspective, this like smoke screen of low purchase prices is really pervasive. But if you are a household that has the means to be able to purchase a $10,000 home and invest $120,000 in refinancing it while paying rent somewhere else, it's, it, for some reason it is hard sometimes for those households to realize like, that's not a possibility for everybody. So that $10,000 purchase price is not a deal on a fixer upper. It is a deal breaker on being able to enter into that market. Um, so I do think that that is just one of those, like, it, it's not really a reality. It is just sheerly a myth out there that those homes are accessible. It is. So and super, oh, yeah. Go, go, go. No, I was just going to say, like, um, I don't know any person who's between 50 and 80 percent AMI that just has, like, 10 grand lying around, first of all. So, like, even if a home is has a low purchase price, you're never going to get a 15, 20, even $30,000 mortgage. Mm -hmm. Banks just don't lend that way. Um, so you have to have that on hand and be credit worthy enough to get money to cover renovations. And like you said, it's, it's just not a realistic um, solution. Yeah. So the last question that I want to address really quickly before we close out, because um, I, I want to leave us on a high note, is are there any cities that have had significant successes with shared equity models, success meaning low and moderate income families retaining home ownership and or building wealth and retaining affordability in a neighborhood that has gentrified? Um, and I think the answer is yes. And there are two that I would point you to. Um, right off the bat to look at. The first would be um, probably the most famous shared equity homeownership program out there in the world, which is uh, Dudley Neighbors, Inc. in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Um, and they have a phenomenal story that you can, there are numerous books and documentaries that you can watch about them, but basically, um, they got started when their neighborhood was predominantly abandoned and um, arson for profit was running rampage across their neighborhood. Uh, and they organized and they organized and they fought and they created partnerships um, and they launched their land trust as, a, as an arm of, as a real estate development arm of their organizing. And um, all of these decades later, they have, uh, they have uh, hundreds of homes that are in trust. Um, that have served even more households um, and that they are still affordable while the neighborhood, due to their really strong efforts, has come up around them um, and is no longer to, affordable to the folks who were living there initially. So that's one example. And the other I would say is Durham. Um, Durham. So in a similar way, Durham got started before the Durham community land trustees got started before the market was really hot um, and helped folks purchase their homes. Those homes are still affordable. Many of those initial homeowners have moved on to other opportunities, and they have now started to get involved pretty heavily in preserving uh, affordable rentals in their neighbor in their target neighborhoods again while like in Durham market values are skyrocketing and these are kind of um, hard fought, hard won oasis, if that's the plural of oasis, um, kind of nodes of affordability that continue to serve as a neighborhood resource. Um, so there are more examples than that, but I just wanted to offer those two as um, concrete examples to close out this conversation. Um, so before I end, I just want to highlight a couple of events that are coming up. If you haven't already registered for the Center for Community Progress's Reclaiming Vacant Properties Conference, please consider yourself cordially invited. The conference is going to be an amazing combination of breakout sessions, mobile workshops, and trainings, and Grounded Solutions is thrilled to be partnering on a number of sessions related to this topic of creating a pipeline of properties for shared equity homeownership. We are also offering a special add-on overnight trip to Albany Georgia to celebrate the 50th anniversary of New Communities, Inc., the first community land trust in the country, which was a farm. 
Um, so not, ha not home ownership as we've been discussing, the first community land trust was a working farm. Um, and you can read more about the conference at reclaimingvacantproperties.org or on Grounded Solutions website, groundedsolutions.org. India, do you want to talk about the CLT Summit? Sure. So if you're planning to come to Atlanta, come early because before the kickoff of the conference, we will be having a CLT Summit that will bring together off um, community land trust practitioners at all levels of practice, so those of us who are just beginning and um, those of us who have been in the, here for the last 50 years, um, and to talk about what we want to see the, the land trust movement look like moving forward for the next 50 years. So the last slide of this deck is going to be um, my email information in India, so if you're interested in participating in that summit, please feel free to reach out. Um, and both Indy and I have mentioned that Grounded Solutions is a membership organization, and we just launched our new membership here. So if you're thinking of exploring a shared equity program or taking the next step in your existing program, you may want to consider being a member for all of the benefits that I've listed on the screen and more. Um, and finally, if you have any burning questions or if you're interested in the summit, um, please feel free to reach out to me or India. And we really appreciate your time and we appreciate the invitation to, ju to join you, Justin. Um, and we hope to see you all in Georgia in just a few weeks. All right. I um, just want to first say thank you again to Beth and India for that really great presentation and the really great discussion around sort of the connections between um, community land trust and um, communities that are both hot and not hot markets and how those interact. Um, I do want to say that we will be taking a short break for the month of September for our Cornerstone webinars, and we hope you will join us on October 24th for the next Cornerstone webinar. And if you have any questions, please go to email me. Um, additionally, um, please visit our website for more information on this and our other upcoming webinars, and have a great afternoon.